this fine facility. For those who don't already know, this group is FAC, the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. We have regular lectures here at 2 p.m. third Saturday of the year during the school year. Our next event, however, breaks that rule in uh, loose conjunction with Philadelphia Science Festival. We're going to have a big event uh, the, on April 28th. We're having Uber skeptic Michael Shermer. Uh, Randy and Shermer are the, uh, the big skeptics. He runs the Skeptic Society, has uh, Skeptic Magazine, been on TV, regular column in Scientific American. He will be speaking 7.30 in the Bonell building on the ground floor in room BG1. Anyone who can give us some help and publicity for this, see me afterwards. We uh, had a lot of people for the Randy event. We want to make sure to do the same for, for that. Uh, then in May, we have a field trip May 17th at Ridley Creek State Park. And once again, our leader for that is Don McGrone, sitting back there. We'll be investigating ghost sightings that are there. Uh, we may not find uh, ghosts or monsters, but we always have a good time learning about the area uh, with uh, Don's guidance for that. Then our annual picnic for people north of here is June 21st at Mundock Common Park in Upper Dublin at the Pavilion in the Woods at 11 a.m. Bring things to uh, throw, eat, books to trade, uh, that kind of thing. More information about all these things is found in our newsletter, which is available over here. Ray Pauk, seated right over here, is our editor that welcomes additions to our wonderful newsletter. Our season would start again in September in this room, September, October, and, and November. Another event that we do, we have volunteers that do it, and anyone's welcome to help us uh, with donations or judging for this, is we had uh, three people, including uh, Dr. David Langdon, run our category of prizes for the science fair at the Carver Science Fair. We, we gave out... Uh, uh, hundreds of dollars of science fair prizes between that and also the Bucks County Science Fair that Tom Napier and I uh, recently did and gave out awards. We like to inspire young people for that uh, some sort of thing. So that uh, can, concludes our events. For anyone who wants to join our group, our acting treasurer for today is our president, Bob Flickman, over here. It's only uh, 25 I uh, think $25 a year. There are for students, there's a sign-up sheet already here to prove that uh, you're here <coughs> for this lecture. Uh, just as a, uh, a quick story before I introduce our speaker on this topic for today, uh, about 35 years ago, I was backpacking with a friend, I was only in my young 20s, in the uh, uh, Black Forest State Park in the middle of Pennsylvania. We were awoken just around dawn by a horrible screeching noise. Uh, my friend peeked out uh, the tent before I did in time to see what he saw was something that looked about seven feet tall, erect, walking away. He only got a glimpse for two seconds. Uh, I, 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 didn't, uh, uh, I didn't see it myself. Uh, I can't possibly believe how a creature that large could exist in a breeding population and ground so thoroughly covered. Uh, I, I've heard screeching noises in the past that have awoken me out of the sound sleep, chilled me to the bone, but it's been screech owls. Uh, I, I don't happen to uh, believe in Bigfoot. I can appreciate other people that have seen something they don't understand can. Uh, but our speaker for today on this topic is uh, Brian Regal, who teaches the history of science at uh, Keene University and has written a book on uh, hunting Sasquatch, which goes beyond uh, just the science of do these things exist, how would they fit in our lineage, but on to kind of the sideshow that goes on for, uh, for people researching those. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Brian Regal. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming. And uh, I'll, I'll start by saying I have never seen Bigfoot. I've never seen a ghost. I've never seen a UFO. I've never seen anyone spontaneously combust. So I feel uh, really quite envious of the people who claim they have seen these things. Um, 
What I would like to talk about today is the history of monster hunting. When people think of cryptozoology today, I'm not a cryptozoologist, uh, I'm a historian of science, uh, but this field fascinates me, uh, the idea that, that um, people are looking for these things which most everyone else tells them is not, are not there. Uh, I started my book off with the sentence, this is a story about dreams that don't come true. Uh, so this is the approach I take. And when people think of cryptozoology, they think of monster hunting today. They tend to think of things like TV show searching or finding Bigfoot, which is unfortunate uh, because they never find anything, uh, despite the title, Finding Bigfoot. Uh, and so most people will get the view of cryptozoology from shows like this or, or uh, Monster Quest or others. And again, this has a tendency to give people who don't know the idea that first off, monster hunting is something new, uh, and secondly, that it's done by amateurs, uh, and that professional scientists are nowhere to be found in this endeavor. Uh, in the book that I wrote, uh, which is subtitled Crackpots and Eggheads, uh, I separate the people who search for monsters like Bigfoot into two categories. The amateur naturalists who are the eggheads uh, and the professional scientists who are the, uh, I'm sorry, the amateurs who are the crackpots and the amateur, uh, the professionals who are the eggheads. And this relationship that they have. Uh, I'm very interested in my research on the relationship between sort of mainstream and fringe science, mainstream and fringe history. And so that's the, that's the approach that I come to it from. And the reality behind all this is that monster hunting goes way back. Uh, it goes back to the classical world, uh, Aristotle, Pliny, uh, Lucretius, another classical author, uh, talked quite a bit about monstrous creatures and thought it was important to try to find them and to look for them because, to their mind, they were trying to establish what the extent of the diversity of life on Earth was. And if monsters were real, then they had to, logically speaking, fit into this wider uh, diversity somewhere. And if they didn't exist, you had to find that out too, because that way you could then dismiss them and go on with, with real work and not have to worry about where strange creatures uh, fit into the uh, biology of life on Earth. And so they were very interested in this, and they did not see it as a fringe thing. They saw it as part and parcel of natural history studies. Uh, in through the Middle Ages and into the early modern period and the Renaissance, people like Ulysses Aldrovandi and... Um, uh, Conrad Gessner published major treatises, multi-volume, thick books on monstrous creatures. And they did not see it as a fringe thing. They didn't see it as a waste of time. They saw it as a central part of uh, the biological endeavor. And so for them, this was just part of what science <coughs> did. So they, they didn't see it as a fringe thing. They saw themselves as erudite scholars looking into something very important. Uh, Carl von Linné, uh, popularly known as Linnaeus, when he publishes his System of Natural in 1735, uh, you know, a major, major turning point in modern scientific thought on biology uh, and, and the diversification of life, he included a section he called the Paradoxa, which were basically monstrous creatures who he, he couldn't figure out where else to put them. They had to fit someplace. And so he sort of threw up his hands and he said, oh, I'll, I'll stick them in a special category. Uh, and so if you go back to early editions of this, you'll see this whole section uh, called the Paradoxa. Eventually he, uh, eventually Linnaeus kind of gets fed up with monsters, and he just dumps them completely. So after about the fifth or sixth edition of the System in Agile, you don't see the paradox up here anymore. Although he did hang on to the Kraken. He thought that was clearly an, a real animal. Uh, and so he put that under the mollusca, uh, so he, he sort of saved one, but all the other ones he eventually dumped. 
Uh, here's one of my favorite illustrations, a woodcut from the early modern period, uh, showing what was then called the monstrous races. Because there are a number of different categories of monsters we're talking about here. Uh, the two primary ones, there are animal monsters and human monsters. And I love this because you see a, a, a wide variety of the most popular monsters of the Renaissance. All the way on the left, uh, that's one of the Scipodii. Uh, these were people with one huge foot, uh, who apparently uh, used that foot for a kind of umbrella. And <laughs> they couldn't figure out what else these creatures might do, and so there are, there are lots of illustrations of ski podes uh, in various manuscripts and early printed books, and they're always in this basic pose. You never see them doing anything other than lying on their backs with this huge foot uh, over their heads. Then next to that, uh, the Cyclops. If you look close, you can see he just has one eye up there. Uh, the classic two-headed baby. Uh, the Blemmy eye. Uh, people with no head but a face in their chest. And I've been trying for years to find out, and I can't seem to get a straight answer from my medievalist friends, quite how this word is properly pronounced. Uh, some people say blemmy some people say blemmies, some people say blimey, which I suspect is where the expression comes from when you're surprised by something that say blimey. Uh, but, uh, so that's the, the blimeys are very popular. And then on the right uh, are the uh, cynocephaly, the dog-headed people who, as a legend, kind of morph into the werewolf story. Uh, and we'll, I'll talk a bit more about the cynocephaly in a minute. Uh, but the other thing I love about this illustration, and what most people miss about it when they look at it, uh, is that in addition to uh, a good image of what people thought the monstrous races for, uh, what, what the monstrous races looked like, uh, this is also an early indication of apparel history, because apparently the monstrous races invented the Speedo. <laughs> and clearly never get the proper, uh, you know, uh, proper justification for a proper, uh, oh, the words flew right out of my head, the proper credit. 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 Thank you. I have a PhD. <laughs> Now, here's some more cynocephaly, and if you are a Catholic, although I guess in this group, at best you'd be a lapsed Catholic, uh, you're, you're familiar with the, the legend of St. Christopher, uh, and there is a, one of the lesser known stories about St. Christopher is that he was a cynocephaly. He was a dog-headed man. Uh, now, the difference between the cynocephaly and the werewolves that come along later are that the cynocephaly don't change. They're born this way, they live their whole lives with a dog head and die that way. Uh, and the legend, and this, the cynocephaly legend of St. Christopher is that somehow uh, he winds up in Bethlehem on a certain evening in the year zero and he sees a commotion going on near a stable and he goes down to see what's going on and there is a family there with some farmyard animals, and apparently three kings are hanging around, and uh, the woman gives birth to a child, and Christopher sees this, and is so sort of taken by this little baby, that he goes in close to look at it, and is, has a epiphany, an emotional, intellectual, spiritual epiphany, and that this darling little baby uh, is something very special, and he reaches over, and the baby reaches up, and with tiny little baby fingers, clasps Christopher's finger, and boom, he's transformed. Uh, and he instantly knows that this is the Son of God, and the Savior of all mankind, and is instantly converted to a follower of baby Jesus. And God is so taken by this moment that he rewards Christopher by changing his dog head into a human head. And he, then he goes on and becomes St. Christopher. Um, so I'll let you take that for what it's worth. But these are a couple of uh, medieval manuscript illustrations of St. Christopher as a werewolf-like creature. Uh, this is an illustration. The one on the left is the Harley manuscript. 
uh, from Oxford, uh, written about 1430, uh, part of John Mandeville's travels. Uh, this is another important work. Uh, Mandeville is a controversial figure, British knight traveler, who, not unlike Marco Polo, travels to the east, to India, to China, and wanders around for a while and comes home, and then writes a book about his travels. Uh, you can still buy copies of Mandeville's travels you know, in any Barnes & Noble or any bookstore in a paperback edition. Uh, but this is an early manuscript copy in which you see more cynocephaly, dog-headed men. Yeah. On the right is John Decker's Herbal from 1676. And you can see this really cute little drawing of a sort of primate creature sitting under a tree eating whatever fruit that is. So this is an indication of how amongst mainstream, what we would today call mainstream scientists, although they didn't use the word scientist back then, but mainstream naturalists, natural philosophers, natural historians, this search for monsters, the examination of monsters, which is considered part and parcel of what you did. Uh, here's a couple of illustrations from Al Gravandi's book. He's probably the most famous of the Renaissance era, late Renaissance, early modern age era uh, monster people, with an uh, illustration of Sinocephaly on the right, and then the sort of chicken-headed man with a really long neck on the left. Uh, if you ever get a chance to look at a copy of Al Gervandi's book, you, you really need to do it because the illustrations are just uh, incredible. Uh, and they all kind of look like this. Now, into the modern period. Uh, this is Edward Tyson's uh, essay on the uh, pygmies and Sinocephaly of the ancients. This is a major scientific step forward in publishing. This is the very first modern technical treatise on primate anatomy. And you can see this wonderful illustration uh, on the right there. And it goes through, as you turn the pages, you see the first illustration is the animal alive, and then you see the musculature, then the musculature is gone, and then it's the skeleton. And in uh, 1697, 1698, Tyson managed to get a hold of a dead primate. That, although we're not sure whether it was actually dead when he got it or was still alive but dying when he got a hold of it. Uh, it was brought in from Angola by some sailors who found it there and decided it would be fun to have this as a pet and brought it on the ship with them and, of course, fed them everything a monkey is not supposed to eat, or a primate, rather. And by the time they got to England, it was on its last legs. And Tyson found out about it and decided he wanted to get a hold of it. So he somehow manages to acquire either the dying primate or the, or the carcass of the dead primate. And he's now going to sit back and do a proper dissection of this and a proper scientific uh, examination. And the result of which is this book. And part of the reason that Tyson wants to do this, and part of the reason why you see words like cynocephaly and satyr and sphinges of the ancients in the title, is because there was quite a debate within European intellectual circles as just what primates were. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, for example, thought they were human, that they were sort of a debased form of human that had yet learned uh, modern technology, modern civilization. They were sort of like pure humans uh, in, in their pure state prior to speech, prior to uh, civilization. And there was quite a, a, a debate going on as to whether stories that, that were everywhere about these strange creatures that you found in Asia and in Africa, what were they? And again, this brings back to this sort of overall attempt by naturalists to figure out where do monsters, first of all, are they real? And secondly, where do they fit, if they are real, where do they fit into the wider run of biological diversity? And so Tyson was familiar with all this, and he saw the dissecting of what he called the pygmy as a way to clear this up. But here you have a body, and once and for all you would do a proper scientific uh, 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 dissection and examination, and you could show once and for all what this thing was, and therefore where it fit into the tree of life. And so he does that. He does painstaking dissection, and has these incredible drawings done, 
and publishes the book, and his final word on this was that the primates were not human, they were related to humans, uh, but they were not human, uh, they were a group apart, somehow related, but different as well. Now, some historians, uh, though not as much uh, uh, these days, have a tendency to want to look at Tyson and say, well, here you go, there's the first example of somebody comparing humans to primates, therefore, he's the first evolutionist. Uh, the problem with that is it's a, that's a little tricky. Uh, Tyson was really not an evolutionist in the way we understand that today. First off, in Tyson's day, the word evolution wasn't really used that much. Uh, they tended to use the word transmutation, uh, which is interesting because transmutation comes from alchemical traditions, not biological traditions. The, the idea, even the, even the term species comes from alchemy as a way of separating different chemicals and different minerals, rocks from each other. They would call them a separate species. And the idea that rocks could somehow transform from one form into another, which is one of the central ideas of alchemy, uh, was called transmutation. And slowly that concept of, of change gets migrates from the geological and the earth science, what we take all the earth sciences, into the biological sciences. So Tyson really wasn't an evolutionist. Uh, he was not sure, by the end of his text, how these differences came about. He had some suspicions, but he really doesn't go. He sort of comes, you know, achingly close to, to explaining transmutation, but then he kind of backs off uh, and, and doesn't. But what's important for our discussion here is that underneath this, what Tyson is trying to do is to prove, are these monsters real or not? And if you look closely at this illustration, you'll see that first off, the creature is standing up. Today we think it's a bonobo uh, rather than a monkey. And, or, or a chimp. Some people said it was either a chimp or it was a bonobo. Uh, today the, the, the common wisdom seems to lean more towards bonobo if it came from Angola. But if you look, it's standing up like a biped, which these creatures don't normally do. They can stand up, but normally they, they like to go uh, on all fours. And if you look in his uh, right hand on the left side of the picture, he's supporting himself with what is clearly a manufactured walking stick, which a, an animal in the wild also would not use. Uh, and so Tyson leaves us with this intriguing illustration of a creature, he has now said, well, this is not a monster, it is a primate, uh, but he has it standing up in an unprimate-like position, walking or supporting itself on a, uh, a walking stick. And I throw this in there because uh, I love this illustration, it was, you, you'll see this it will pop up again at the end of the, at the, end of the lecture. Uh, but this is the cover of uh, Bickerstaff's Boston Almanac for the year 1785. And it is a, a, a rather crude copy of Tyson's Pygmy. It is, as far as I can tell, I might be wrong, but as far as I can tell, this is the very first printed illustration of a primate ever to appear in North America. And the first time I saw it, the first thing I thought of was what? What does it look like? Pregnant. Yeah. It looks like Bigfoot. Yeah. A happy Bigfoot. <laughs> uh, but Bigfoot nonetheless. And so it's just intriguing that this picture shows up. Uh, it's a copy of Tyson. It's a copy of that. Uh, but still, it has this kind of Bigfoot-like feel to it. Uh, at this point, I suppose I should get some definitions clear. We're talking about monsters. Monsters, monsters, monsters. What is our definition of a monster? The word monster comes, the English word monster comes from the Latin monstrum, which does not mean what most people think it means. Uh, it means a prodigy or a portent of things to come. In Greco-Roman theater, Certain characters 
were known as monsters. Not because of what they looked like, but because of what they, the action they performed in the play on stage. When a monster character appeared on stage, the audience, who presumably was familiar with the various uh, tropes uh, and idiosyncrasies of uh, Greek theater, knew that something's about to happen. That's why this, this character will come on and do some things, you know, ah, something's about to happen here. Uh, if you, in modern film, we use monsters all the time. In Jaws, for example, the monster, according to the traditional meaning, is not the shark. The monster is that music. <laughs> that dun, that dun, that dun, that music. Because even for people who, who received this for the very first time had never heard that music before, the minute it came on, you knew something's going to happen. And so in Greco-Roman theater, that's what the monster did. So you'd be sitting there watching a play, and a character would come on, and you just knew, okay, pay attention, something's about to happen. That's why when little children are very good at something, extraordinarily good at something, we call them prodigies. Because we think, well, if a five-year-old can write a symphony, imagine the work they'll do when they're 30. So they, this ability now at a young age is a portent of what is to come. And what happens is how that gets links to what we're talking about and how the term monster takes on the meaning that most of us uh, understand is that in the Middle Ages in Europe, when... A child was born with a deformity. They would call it a monstrous birth. And hence the picture I showed you before, monstrous racism. They didn't know how to explain why a baby might be born two heads, or three arms, or no arms, or no eyes, or whatever the deformity was. And so they put it down to natural, or they put it down to supernatural causes. And they assumed that when a child was born with some sort of birth defect, that was a bad omen. That meant something bad was going to happen. That meant the, the king might die, or an invading army might be coming along, or a plague might be about to hit, or a terrible storm was about to hit. Uh, and so they, of course, would see later, after the thing happened, oh, well, that baby, when the baby was born two heads, that proved that this great storm was going to happen. And so they saw the birth of a deformed child as a portent as a prodigy of something bad to come. And because a two-headed baby was pretty startling, uh, and, or, the, or the baby might be born with a deformed face, which was pretty uh, unattractive or ugly, the word monster starts taking on the meaning of not just a prodigy or a portent of things to come, but something ugly and terrifying and scary. So by the end of the Middle Ages, into the Renaissance, and even into the well into the early modern period, these creatures were called monstrous births, and the same thing if a cow was born with two heads. Uh, that this was an indication of things to come. Bad things were about to happen because this terrible, this ugly baby, deformed child, whatever, uh, uh, a dog born with no legs would appear, and therefore, you know, you gotta get ready because bad things are happening. Uh, question? Yeah, I'm sorry. <clears throat> because like they feel like, like these bad things will happen. Like, do they like kill off the babies that are deformed or like the animals? That depend upon the. There was no set tradition. Uh, in most cases, they didn't really need to kill the baby because it wasn't gonna survive very long anyway. Uh, and so it didn't. You know, it didn't really last long enough for people to say, "Oh, maybe we should kill it. That'll stop the." And now what's really interesting about that, as a cultural thing, is in India, for example, in the Hindu world, a baby born with more than two arms or more than two legs, far from being seen as a bad omen, was seen as a good omen, because it re resembles Shiva, uh, or Parvati, or any one of a number of multi-armed Hindu gods. And so, rather than people being frightened by this in that culture, this was seen as sort of a good omen, that good, good things were going to happen. Uh, and so it's, it's interesting to notice the, the dichotomy between the Western Christian culture and the Eastern Hindu culture, how they looked at uh, deformed children. 
the other hand, all females were unwelcome. Well, <laughs> yes, but a female with multiple arms might be considered a good thing, so. Now, getting back to how, what I started, how today people view cryptozoology, they view monster hunting, largely due to these awful TV shows, as something very fringe, something which mainstream science rebuffs, uh, the grand narrative, if you will, of cryptozoology is that the eggheads, the, uh, the, the, the trained scientists, the professional scholars, reject cryptozoology as foolishness, and it is the crackpots, the amateurs, who are doing the real work. Because they go out in the field, and they set up their cameras, and they wait for Bigfoot to come along, or the Jersey Devil, or, or you know, whatever. Uh, whatever monster or, or sea monster, whatever you're chasing along, they're the ones who are going, they're being the real scientists. It's those professional academics in their, walled up in their universities, in their ivory tower. Um, I want to know where that ivory tower is. <laughs> I've never seen it. I certainly don't work in an ivory tower. I'm in the trenches uh, at my school. And I don't know anybody who's in an ivory tower. So, but anyway, I digress. The question then becomes, if we today view this as something on the fringe, and as I just showed you, uh, monster studies, if we can use that phrase, begins with ancient scholars and goes through all the most famous uh, intellects of the day, where does the break come? How does it go from being a central part of biological studies to being something kicked out onto the fringe? And it starts with this guy. This is Richard Owen, uh, who is probably one of the most famous Victorian naturalists of the 19th century. He's well-connected politically. He is, for a time, he is the tutor of Victoria's children. Uh, he helps organize the British Museum. Uh, he is at the top of the intellectual social food chain in Victorian England. He's also very interested in monsters. And it is his engagement with monsters, I argue, that will start off uh, the disconnect of mainstream science with monster studies. As someone who's very well connected and someone who uh, studies monsters, oh, and uh, he is the one who coins the term dinosaur uh, in 1835, I think it was. So he's a scientist who has experience with monsters, with monstrous creatures. This is not something new to him. And because of that, he starts getting asked by the Admiralty to look at sea monster reports. Uh, possibly the most famous of all the 19th century sea monsters is this one. This is the 1848 Daedalus case. The HMS Daedalus was a British warship operating in the Mediterranean, uh, preparing to come back to England when it supposedly encounters this giant sea monster. Now, within sea monster lore, there are sea monsters and there are sea serpents. Technically speaking, the Daedalus creature was a sea serpent because it looks like a giant snake. It's basically a long, cylindrical creature with a head and no discernible limbs. A sea monster is anything else. Anything with arms or you know, tentacles or giant goggly eyes. Uh, and so there, even within the world of monsters in the sea, there are technicalities. Uh, and so the, the Daedalus case was very famous. It was in the news a lot. As soon as the Daedalus got back to Plymouth, the captain went and spoke to reporters and said, we saw this creature. This illustration came out right away. Uh, and there's actually several illustrations of the Daedalus monster floating around that you can find. And it was accepted as a legitimate sighting because it was sighted by British naval officers who were all gentlemen who would never lie about such a thing. And despite the fact that they had no evidence other than eyewitness reports, that was enough for most people because a captain of one of Her Majesty's warships would never lie about anything. Owen was willing to accept that, but he wanted to look into it more. 
And the Admiralty actually goes to him and says, could you check this out? And this starts him on a rather two-pronged career with sea monsters, uh, a kind of public career. He's, he's noted in the papers quite a bit talking about this. Uh, and then he keeps a private scrapbook, which still exists, uh, which is in the British Museum of Natural History, and where he keeps track of sea monster sightings. People start sending him material. He cuts out newspaper articles. Uh, the, he gets to talk to these officers uh, directly to see what's going on. And as, he looking, as he's looking into this, he realizes that something funny has happened. Because there's no physical evidence. And he says, well, I'm a scientist. I need physical evidence. No one's bringing <coughs> physical evidence. And he says, uh, he writes into his notebook, and what to me is strangest of all, knowing that 300 or more joints may have formed the long backbone of each of the thousands of deceased individuals, that is sea monsters, not a single vertebra has been sent for my inspection from any shore, nor can I hear of any such specimen having been forwarded to any museum. So in other words, as a scientist, he says, if sea monsters are real, there's got to be lots of them. There has to be breeding populations, which means they, they would have to be washing up on shore all the time. And this really wouldn't be a question that these creatures exist, because we would have their skeletons, we'd have their remains, we'd see them. But he says, none of that has happened. A few bits and pieces have turned up, uh, which he looks at, but he says, you know, that's a whale, this is an oar fish, this is, uh, I don't know what that is, but it's not, a, it's not from a living thing. And so he begins writing articles and countering this popular idea that monsters exist. And it is his skepticism over monsters, especially sea monsters, which starts to turn the tide against mainstream scientific belief in monsters. At the time, Charles Darwin, who is still friends with Owen, this is before their big break, uh, he sees Owen's newspaper accounts, and he writes a letter, writes this really funny letter to Owen, saying, I've never heard of anything so astounding as the logbook of your HMS Diddlius. And he intentionally, as a joke, he spells the ship's name wrong. Uh, remember, Darwin had been on the Beagle voyage for years. He had seen all sorts of strange sea creatures and had never seen anything like what had been described by eyewitnesses as sea monster. And so what is beginning to happen in the mid-19th century is that a whole host of important uh, scientists, even Darwin's friend Huxley, T.H. Huxley, uh, at one point he says, you know, I, I was on the rattlesnake for years. I collected all sorts of marine uh, life. I've never seen anything even closely resembling any of what are being called sea monsters. Uh, and so mainstream science and the public begins to back off and say, well, if scientists like Owen, uh, Darwin, and Huxley are saying these things aren't real, or that they're just misidentifications, uh, Owen figured it was people seeing whales having sex, which is a pretty rare phenomenon for human beings to see. Uh, and in his notebook, he draws these crude but charming little drawings of whales kind of, you know, <laughs> doing the thing that he thinks they're doing, that people are seeing. Even uh, Prince Albert, at one point at a party, sees Owen, because Owen was that, that kind of social stature that he would be at parties where the Prince Regent was. And Albert comes over and he says, Oh, Dr. O Owen, you know, you're, I'm so upset with you. Uh, you killed all the sea monsters. I love sea monsters. Now you killed them all, now I can't believe in sea monsters anymore. Uh, and so this is what begins the turnover from <coughs> mainstream scientific acceptance. Now, Darwin, of course, like all these guys, was very interested in monsters. Because while he's working on his evolution theory, he's reading books on monstrous creatures, particularly a Frenchman named Geoffrey St. Hilaire, who in the 1840s publishes the first major scientific book on teratology, which is the modern word we use for the study of of birth defects. And Darwin says uh, to a friend of his, I never understood the halfway link, but merely one in a long series. 
I think you have done some good service in pointing out how rare halfway links are, if indeed they exist. Uh, this is, uh, I always love to look at this sentence whenever I hear creation talking about, well, if evolution's real, there should be, you know, an animal which is half of a pigeon and half of an alligator. Why aren't there... <laughs> Uh, and even Darwin says, but that's not the way it works. You don't have 50% of one and 50% of another. Uh, back in 2009, I gave a paper at the, at the British Society for the History of Science uh, convention in, uh, where was it? Was it Leicester? I think it was Leicester. No, it was at Oxford. On uh, Darwin and werewolves. And I said, well, you know, the, the advent of of Darwinian evolution theory helped kill off werewolves. Because according to evolution theory, you can't have a werewolf. It doesn't work. You can't have a primate and a canine screwed together. They're just, they are biologically related ultimately, as all living things are, but they're not close enough to be part one, part, part of the other. And somehow this made it into USA Today. To this day, I don't even know how. And the next thing I know, I start getting these phone calls and email messages. Can you come and talk about how Darwin killed off the werewolves? Um, and, you know, I try to explain to people, you know, it's just kind of joking. You know, Darwin really doesn't talk about werewolves at all. He didn't believe in them. Uh, but it was kind of fun for a while to have people talking around. And, uh, online, I do some social media. I do a little Twittering. And at least once every four or five months, Someone sends me a Twitter thinking that I'm the comic Brian Regan, who's a very funny guy. I'm a big fan of his, but I, and I, I always have to write back to him and say, you know, I'm not Brian Regan. He's a lot funnier than I am, but I know more about werewolves. <laughs> oh, and here's the, this is Darwin's personal copy of Hilaire's book, and you can see all this marginalia along the side where, um, where he writes in his thoughts as he's reading. Uh, this, the, the one copy of this is at Cambridge, and I was lucky enough to get a chance to look at it. Uh, this, that's actually Darwin's handwriting at the bottom there, where he's reading, and he's trying to see if he can connect monster studies, or if monsters' births can tell him something about generation, something about transmutation, and he thought that it could. Uh, that's one of the... One of the uh, Aspects of Darwin's work that isn't really discussed that much is interested in monsters. And here, here he writes, uh, and this is in the marginalia. So I must allude to this when I give my view of cause of deviations to parent treatment before impregnation. So he sees that the anomalies of monstrous births have something to say about the way living things are generated and how transmutation works. By the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, Mainstream science has pretty much abandoned monster studies completely. And that leaves a vacuum. And as we know in physics, vacuum doesn't want to exist. Things want to rush in. And who rushes into the vacuum but the amateurs, the crackpots. And it starts in large part uh, with this photograph right here. This is known as the Shipton print. Uh, this was a photograph taken by a uh, famous British mountaineer, Eric Shipton, in 1953 uh, while trying to climb Mount Everest. And he claimed that he saw a whole line of these prints, and one of his men snapped off some pictures, and it quickly got into the newspapers. Before Bigfoot becomes popular, there's the Yeti, the abominable snowman, which is sort of the granddaddy, the, the cryptid granddaddy of cryptozoology. Uh, and this is a legend uh, from the Himalayas, from Tibetan Himalayan culture, from Sherpa culture, about a giant creature, a hairy creature that runs around um, and sort of scares people, sort of a human-like, hairy thing. And it's interesting, the word yeti actually is a, is a Western corruption, uh, scholars think, of the word mete, which is the Sherpa word for that thing over there. <laughs> so that thing over there, yeah, that thing over there. That we see. Uh, the word abominable snowman comes from a British, in the 1920s, a British mountaineer who claimed he saw one of these things and asked his Sherpa guides, what do you call that? What, do you, what is that? 
And I guess he didn't speak the Sherpa language very well, and they tried to explain to him what this was. And then he, when he, as soon as he got near a telegraph station, he sent a dispatch to the Calcutta Statesman, which was a big newspaper in India at the time, an English language newspaper in India. And in the, in the garbled communication of sending this message back and forth, it came out abominable snowman. And that's the one that kind of stuck. And so when Shipton saw this thing in 1953, he, he assumes, I saw the abominable snowman, and uh, I'm going to take a picture of it. And these prints, these photographs were, were sent around the world. They caused quite a stir. Uh, it led to numerous expeditions uh, to the Himalayas to find uh, the Yeti, find the abominable snowman. And we don't have, really have the time to talk about it now, but there's a whole really intriguing spy angle to the search for the Yeti. Uh, a lot of the Americans and British explorers who went to Nepal, went to Tibet, searching for the Yeti, all had very shady intelligence backgrounds. <laughs> Almost all of them had served in one capacity or another during World War II, either for British intelligence in Asia or the OSS, which was the forerunner to the CIA, uh, also in Asia. And so either that's just a really big coincidence or there was something going on. Uh, the Chinese thought that they were spying, the Russians thought that they were spying, and uh, there are newspaper accounts in the 50s of the, of, in, from Izvestia saying these are just capitalist, imperialist, you know, they're using this, this monster thing as a ruse to get in to the region, because remember at the same time, this is when the whole Tibet issue begins coming up, uh, when China invades Tibet and takes over, uh, and so there was quite a, a fascinating um, spy angle to all this that, that someday should be made into a movie uh, that I would be happy to be a technical advisor on if anyone's thinking of. I just got to throw that out there and make a great movie. Uh, but it's the shift in print that kind of really gets people excited about the uh, abominable snowman. Uh, in the We've already talked about the grandfathers of cryptozoology, the fathers of cryptozoology, Ivan Sanderson, Bernard Hubelmans, and Vili Lay. Sanderson is a Cambridge-trained zoologist. Uh, Hubelmans has a PhD uh, in zoology. So ironically, the kind of gods of the amateurs are both trained professional scientists. Uh, they, in the 1940s and 50s, separately, are thinking along the same lines, that legends of strange creatures, some of them, must have some kind of basis in reality. And they both claim that independently, they came up with the word cryptozoology. Uh, Sanderson says he was using it as early as the 1930s. Uh, cryptozoology is from the Greek for hidden animals. That is, animals that are not officially described by mainstream science, but which have a kind of folkloric uh, or ritual or even religious uh, aspect to them. Uh, Billy Lay, uh, who's not normally thought of as a cryptozoology person, uh, was a German rocket pioneer who leaves Nazi Germany as the Nazis are rising, unlike his friend uh, Werner von Braun, who is all too ready to sell his soul to the Nazis, Billy Lay isn't, and the only way out for him, he thinks, is to leave Germany, and he goes first to England, then comes to America, and will build a whole career as one of the first really popular public scientists. Uh, because he worked a lot of rocketry, uh, most of those great 1950s rocket ship movies, he was a technical advisor on. Uh, but he also dabbled in what he called romantic zoology. So he had his own term for it. He actually wrote several books on it, uh, on animals that are not described by science but have this kind of folklore aspect to it. Now, along with the amateurs who are running around searching for the Yeti, there are also a string of mainstream scientists. John Napier, Carlton Kuhn, George Agagino, and William Charles Osmond Hill. Uh, Napier was a New World, I'm sorry, Napier was a, an English anthropologist. Uh, Carlton Kuhn was a Harvard-trained anthropologist. 
Uh, George Agagino is a New World archaeologist. William Charles Osmond Hill, another British biologist. All impeccable credentials, as mainstream as you could get, but all who believe these creatures are real, believe that the Yeti was an actual animal, and were involved in a number of ways in the Asia uh, Yeti hunt, uh, with uh, Carl Kuhn even going so far as traveling to Tibet and going on expeditions himself. He thought that they were that uh, real for him to uh, concern his, or to commit his career to them. Now, the most recent, or let's say the most important of the 20th century scientists who engaged with monsters is Grover Kranz. Uh, I kind of see him, uh, the book I wrote on monster hunting is, is largely a biography of Kranz. I see him as this kind of tragic character. Uh, he is an academically trained paleoanthropologist. He goes to Berkeley and studies in the 1950s and 60s with the cream of the crop of American paleoanthropology. Uh, and he's as well trained, as academically trained an anthropologist as you could possibly get in the mid 20th century. And he's fascinated by monsters. While he's finishing his doctorate at the University of Minnesota, he hears about the Patterson film, which you may be, you, you probably all know, even if you don't realize you know it. It's that very short clip of the sort of Bigfoot walking through the woods, and at one point he turns around and looks, and walks away, it's the Patterson film. And he hears about this, and, he's, and he says, well, I, you know, I lived in California, I'm going to take some time off, and I'm going to go see if I can uh, find something. So he takes a, you know, it was like the Easter vacation or something, uh, it might even have been the spring break, he decides to head back to California, to Bluff Creek, where the Patterson film was shot. And he spends a couple of days wandering around, doesn't see anything, but he sort of has a, a good time, and he goes back to uh, Minnesota, finishes his doctorate, and gets a job at Washington State University as an assistant professor of anthropology. And that's in 1968. So here's a picture of him as a young man. He loved big dogs, uh, especially Irish wolfhounds. He had a thing for Irish wolfhounds. He had one, uh, oh, he was also a, a veteran, served in the military. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. He had one Irish wolfhound named Clyde, which was a huge dog. And Krantz was a bit quirky. And he had some personal issues. Um, he's living in Berkeley during the summer of love. And, you know, he, he develops a bit of a drinking problem, he develops a bit of a drug problem. Uh, he's on the verge of total collapse. His career seems like it's going nowhere. Uh, he was fighting with his, his doctoral advisor at Berkeley, um, screwed him out of a writing job that had come along, and he just felt like, you know, I wasted my whole life doing this. And so he gets this giant Irish wolfhound he calls Clyde, which saves his life. He becomes his best friend ever. And... <coughs> In 1972, I think, or 73, Clyde dies. And Kranz is just heartbroken because this was like his best friend. He never has in his whole life a human friend, a human relationship as close. He's married like four times. <laughs> but the closest relationship he ever has is with this dog. And he wants to keep the skeleton. But he can't bring himself to dissect it. I mean, he's a skilled dissector. While he's a graduate he works as a, as a taxidermist in, in California. So he's a skilled taxidermist. He knows how to do this, but he can't bring himself to cut on Clyde. And so he decides to take the easy way out. And he takes Clyde and he buries him in the backyard. If you have a pet and you want to get his skeleton or her skeleton, but you don't want to get messy about it, take it out in the yard and bury it and leave it there for a year. And come back and dig it up again and you'll just have a skeleton because Mother Nature will come and bugs will eat it and we'll just, we'll just leave the bones. And so that's what Kranz decides to do with Clyde. Buries it in the yard, comes back a year or so later uh, and decides to dig it up. And one day uh, he goes out to the yard and the sun is going down and he's all by himself 
and he starts digging where Clyde is buried. And of course, what's the first thing to come out is the skull. And he's, you know, he has this sort of well of emotion. And he sits down in this, you know, half hole with the dog skeleton. And he has this like Shakespearean moment where he's staring into the eyes of Clyde. You know, because now it's just a skeleton, it's just a skull. Uh, and he begins, you know, he, he has this, you know, this sort of dark night of the soul moment. You know, he, he asks himself, what, why, why do we do this? Why do we get so caught up with animals and pets? They just die on us. And then, you know, we're left with the emotions. And I think that what happens is, around that time is when he starts thinking about maybe these Bigfoot creatures uh, are real. And I think what happens is he substitutes Bigfoot for Clyde. Because Bigfoot, he's never going to bury Bigfoot in his yard. He's never going to have a Bigfoot friend. So he can have a, a relationship with a sort of a big hairy animal without it getting too close. Uh, and I, you know, I always, I always find this very sort of touching human moment uh, where, where, where he sort of makes this decision. Now the big change, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, the big change, his big epiphany comes in 1969 in a, a, a pair of tiny little villages called Bosburg and Colville in the state of Washington, which is where Washington State University is, right on the Canadian border. Uh, word comes out around Thanksgiving that somebody has seen a Bigfoot-like creature running around the local uh, trash dump. And it sort of coincides with the holiday period of school. He drives up there to see what's what. And while he's up there, he sees these footprints in the snow. And what's strange about it is giant footprint, a bunch of them, they're all over the place actually. Um, but they have these sort of strange, from the footprint in, in, the, in the snow, the, the foot had this, these sort of strange bumps on the side. And this is a wonderful photograph because what you're seeing here is a man changing his mind. You see a human brain actually changing its opinion of something. Because he gets there and he says, okay, so where are the footprints? And someone says, oh, there's oh, some good ones over there. We covered them up with a newspaper. So he goes over and he bends down and he peels up the newspaper and he looks at this thing. And he was trained as an anatomist. He knows primate foot anatomy. He knows human foot anatomy. He looks at this thing and the light bulb goes off. He says, this is real. Because no backwoods, you know, bump, country bumpkin hoaxer could have faked the anatomy in a giant broken foot. And so the only explanation, he says, is that this must have been made by a real creature, a real living thing. Therefore, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, whatever you want to call it, is real. And from this point on, his whole professional career will revolve around him trying to prove that this creature is real. Uh, here's a slightly better, you can just see. Right here, there are the toes. And here are these sort of projections on the outside of the foot that he thought were caused by the creature at some point falling or stepping on something and breaking its foot. And the foot healed in this position, you know, sort of healed badly, and so caused these two permanent bulges on the, on the outside. Now, this is Rain de Hinden. Uh, this is Krantz's crackpot counterpart. Uh, fascinating, fascinating character, considered one of the fathers of modern Bigfoot studies. Uh, he's Swiss, he's born in Switzerland, comes, winds up in Western Canada, and immediately jumps into the fray of searching for these creatures. Uh, the Hinden and Cranch will battle through letters, there are all these letters down at the Smithsonian, uh, of them back and forth, calling each other names, cursing each other, and... Uh, what he's holding here are casts, plaster casts, of those prints that Kranz is looking at in the photograph. And again, you can see right here these bulges. 
which Krantz argued could only have been caused by, a bro by broken bones in the foot, and so therefore the thing must be real. Uh, he becomes obsessed with this. Uh, he, he produces reams and reams of mathematical calculations trying to prove from a biomechanical point of view that these creatures can exist. He's also well known. He gets into the papers. <laughs> he appears on the TV show In Search of, uh, Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World. Uh, you can find the clips on, on, uh, on Google, on, on YouTube. <coughs> and I include these here because these are just charming letters that little kids began to write to him. Uh, this little group up in Vermont decided they were going to form a Bigfoot hunting club. Like the, like the little rascals. Uh, and what's interesting, they're all girls. The only example I know of, uh, the, the first example, the earliest example I know of, of a Bigfoot hunting club uh, by a, a group of young girls. And they send these charming letters with a little drawing you can see. Uh, where they got the comedy Richard Nixon letterhead from, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, probably from their dad, I guess, you know, or an uncle or something. And so, uh, they tell them what they're doing. You know, we formed a club and we, we go out looking for the monster. Here's some more. I love that last line. Maybe we can all find something. <laughs> Uh, and there he is. And what Cranch represents is sort of the last gasp of really overt scientific interest in monsters. There are some <clears throat> academics, university people who are involved in this in, in limited ways. Uh, cryptozoology people, amateurs, are, are always complaining, you know, why don't scientists take us seriously? And the answer is because they have careers. <laughs> they spent a lot of time going to school, you know, doing their research, uh, and there are a lot of mainstream scientists today who are very interested in this, but very few of them come out publicly. Uh, the idea that mainstream science is somehow in a, involved in a conspiracy to cover up, you know, oh, it's those damn scientists, they know Bigfoot's real. <laughs> The government knows Bigfoot's real. They're just covering. Why would they cover it up? <laughs> Any paleoanthropologist would love to be the person to prove these creatures are real. I, I got an answer to that once. From okay. Somebody who was not very scientific or smart said to avoid mass panic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. Uh, Right. That's the thing that's going to cause mass panic. Not any of the other stuff you want to talk about. If only. If only. Uh, but uh, he's, he's sort of like the, the last of a dying breed. Uh, he dies in 2002, and no one really... Uh, there's a guy out in Idaho, Jeff Meldrum, who sort of steps into the place, but we can see his, his career has suffered... Uh, he has been taunted by his, uh, by his colleagues for this work, and so anybody who really cares about their career is not going to openly get involved in this, uh, because they... Uh, I can kind of get away with it, because I'm not a scientist, I'm a historian. So I'm approaching this from a historical point of view. Uh, and my colleagues in my university have been very generous uh, in their support of what I've been doing. Uh, but anybody who's a, who's a, a scientist, biologist, field zoologist, animal behaviorist, they don't want to get involved in this because they know it can, it can kill their career. Yes? Uh, during the 50s, like when they were searching for um, Bigfoot mm -hmm. and Yeti, um, the, 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 the so-called discovery of the missing link, was that all like... Well, the missing link is a, is a misleading term, uh, which scientists do not use anymore. Yeah. It suggests... It, in its crudest form, in its simplest, most simple-minded form, evolution says A turns into B turns into C. Therefore, B is halfway between A and C, linking A and C. But that kind of simplistic view of how evolution works is not accepted by mainstream science anymore. Uh, 
Uh, really, the only people who talk about missing links are creationists. The only people who use the term Darwinist are creationists. Evolutionary biologists do not call themselves Darwinists. They certainly respect Darwin, and they, they hold him in esteem as an important historical figure. Uh, but uh, uh, today, uh, uh, an evolutionary biologist, because we know so much more now than what Darwin knew, uh, an evolutionary biologist today would not call himself a Darwinist any more than a, an astronomer would call himself a Copernican. <laughs> but yes, Copernicus is an important character, you know, first one to really come out with the whole idea of the heliocentric universe, but astronomy has moved so far beyond what Copernicus did, they're not even, almost not connected anymore. Uh, and so when you, when you see terms like Darwinist, or missing link, uh, that's really someone using that term to disparage science rather than. Uh, and for the shameless self-promotion part of the afternoon, uh, this is my book, which just recently came out in paperback, Searching for Sasquatch, Crackpots, Eggheads, and Cryptozoology. And I would like to thank you all for coming. And uh, Question, please? Yeah, questions. So, um, these um, so-called claims of sighting, mm -hmm. is this some kind of a, a psychological phenomenon? I don't know. <laughs> I will not, I will not uh, comment on that because I'm not a psychologist. That is beyond my area of expertise. Uh, a couple of years ago, I spoke at a convention in England, uh, which is... Um, Sponsored by the Fortean Times, which is, if you don't know, is a wonderful magazine, uh, which I've actually published articles in on, on, on a number of occasions, but they asked me to come and speak on this topic. And big crowd, you know, and gave my talk and questions, and a young lady asked, uh, you know, well, what, if, if these things don't exist, then what are people seeing? I said, well, I don't know. I'm not a field person. I'm not, I was born in the Iron Bat of Newark. I don't know about woods. Uh, <laughs> And she kept pressing me. I said, well, I don't know, maybe a lot of people say they're, they're, they're seeing bears. Well, bears, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, in that case, no, I don't. <laughs> uh, I just gave a talk on, uh, the book I'm working on now is on, the, uh, is on the history, the unknown history of the Jersey Devil. And I just gave a talk at the Pinelands uh, Commission in New Jersey. It has a big convention every year uh, with different speakers on sort of uh, Pine Barrens related topics, and they asked me to come and speak. And uh, I had a, I had a picture of the a drawing of the sort of classic drawing of the Jersey Devil up on the wall. And someone said, "Well, if people aren't seeing, you know, if the Jersey Devil doesn't exist. What are they people seeing?" I said, "I don't know, but it's not that." <laughs> so I don't know what people are seeing. Um, they're seeing something. And if someone says, "Oh, I saw the Jersey Devil. I saw Bigfoot," I'm not going to argue with them. Uh, they saw something. A lot of them are hoaxes. Uh, you know, we have this thing going on right now. The guy supposedly has a, a Bigfoot body. Uh, Again. Certainly, yeah, it certainly seems like a hoax. <laughs> there was a thing in 2008, it was 2009 in Georgia, where the guy, a couple of guys claimed they had found a Bigfoot and they were keeping it in a refrigerator, and it turned out to be a Halloween costume with, you know, some roadkill entrails. <laughs> you know, drip done. Uh, the only way this will ever be solved, the only what thing that's going to prove that these creatures are real, if they are real, is for someone to bring in a body. I know that's sort of a cliched answer, but that's the answer. No amount of video footage, no amount of blurry photographs uh, is going to prove this. They, they have to bring one in, bring it to a major university, throw it on a dissecting table, and then we'll know what these things are if they're really out there. Yes? I'm wondering, does cryptozoology also include some of the more near science uh, studies that are looking into, say, the ivory-billed uh, woodpecker? Well, see, the funny thing about all this is, kind of scientists find unknown species every day. Mm -hmm. yes. And they don't try to hide it. And yeah, they don't <laughs> cover it up. There's, there's, no, there's no conspiracy to keep dung beetles, the knowledge of dung beetles from, from panicking the population. Uh, but, you know, for, for a, an ornithologist who spends five years slogging through some rainforest and finally finds this thing that he thought was there all the time, no one outside of ornithology cares. When an entomologist discovers a new species of beetle, 
Entomologists would get excited, <laughs> but nobody else gets excited. Uh, but to say, you know, Bigfoot just walked through my backyard, suddenly everybody gets excited about that. So the idea of finding unknown species is, is really quite normal for science. Uh, and I even, I don't think Bigfoot is real. I think by now, for a whole number of reasons, we, we would know. We, we wouldn't be here talking about it because we'd know it was real. We know bears exist. Do we find bear skeletons in the woods? Not very often. But we know bears, are, we have pictures of bears, bears wander around, we know bears are there, the existence of bears is not an issue. So if Bigfoot was real, if these sort of creatures were real, I don't think it would be an issue. I think it would just be another animal, we'd, very unusual, very strange, you know, a, a, one of the few bipeds ever, uh, but I don't think they're out there. But, having said that, I think people, you know, when I used the word egghead, when my book first came out, a lot of, there were a number of people uh, who fall into that category, got very upset with me. <laughs> You're making fun of us. You're making fun of us. First of all, I'm not, because the term egghead comes from Ivan Sanderson. The father of cryptozoology used the term egghead and crackpot. And so I used terms like crackpot as terms of endearment. <laughs> no, really, I, I don't think you should make fun of them. Some of the people on TV I think you should make fun of, because they deserve to be made fun of. Um, the worst enemies cryptozoology has are not mainstream scientists. It's cryptozoologists, because they're the ones out there running around acting wacky. And that's what gives the field a bad... There are some terrific people out there here in the U.S., in England, who are smart, sharp people. Uh, and if any of these things are ever proven real, it's these guys and gals who will do it. Um, but you should be out there. Uh, I disagree with some mainstream scientists and historians who say, you know, you know, this is really important. Searching for monsters isn't important. And I say, well, yes, it is. Uh, the history of science is replete with examples of people who went out looking for A, never found it, but found B instead, yeah. and changed science uh, by finding the thing they weren't looking for. So I think people should be out there running around in the woods um, looking for stuff, because a mainstream scientist is probably not the, going to be the ones who find these things. It's going to be the amateurs who are out there you know, filled with passion, spending their own money, uh, you know, in a little tent, in the rain, in the woods, waiting for Bigfoot to go walking by. If it's out there, they're the ones who are going to find it. Uh, which is ironic, because the minute they find it, it's going to be taken away from them. <laughs> and they will be pushed, the amateurs will be pushed out, and this thing will become part of anthropology, maybe even paleoanthropology, and professional scientists will take over, and the amateurs will be pushed out. Yes? Besides the abominable snowman, do you think the legend of the wild man had any influence in the development of the idea of Bigfoot? Well, there are wild man legends from around the world. Uh, there is no one wild man idea. Uh, the concept of the sort of vague wild man is both a biological uh, and a cultural thing. People on the fringes of society, people who, who leave the mainstream and go off on their own, uh, who become wild, uh, I think that's part of, part of that. But, and it's certainly, I think the modern, the 20th century, Bigfoot, Yeti, Orang Pendek, you know, there's, there's a, a, dozens and dozens of names for these creatures. I think, you're right, I think it is ultimately, at least from a cultural point of view, until we find out they're real biologically, from a cultural point of view, they come out of the wild man, the other, uh, the human-like but not human. Uh, and this is a way of kind of explaining that, kind of dealing with it. Uh, did that answer your question at all? Well, there was, in the 19th century, there was mm -hmm. a huge number of stories of people going to the wild, they were out camp robbers, whatever, sure. and they'd be in the wilderness, their clothes would eventually fall off, mm -hmm. they would grow hair, sure. they may walk on all fours, right, feral they people. Be very big. Mm -hmm. men, and they couldn't be seen if brought back into society right. and would lose their hair and look back like we look. Mm -hmm. And there was an enormous amount of, of uh, stories like that. And when Bigfoot first started, in, in, when Red Wallace was, was making those footprints out in California, 
There was a letter to the Humboldt Times by a lady mm -hmm. saying that this was the Wildman was associated with the Sasquatch, sure. the, the degenerate Indian mm -hmm. tribe right. that would had this hair. Mm -hmm. And then when when uh, Jerry Cruz brought that class of hair thing, mm -hmm. the Humboldt Times put North American abominable snowman. Right. And it seems to have deviated this one from the Wildman legends that we saw huge numbers of them in the 19th and early 20th century into the eighth. Sure. Yeah, I mean that, that certainly is part of it. Uh, legends like Bigfoot, legends like the Abominable Snowman, legends like the Jersey Devil, uh, or the Snallygaster, which is sort of the Maryland version of the Jersey Devil. Um, and in, in Africa, there's Okubawa, which is very Jersey Devil-like in its description, which is a 20th century thing. But but all those sort of monster stories have a cultural element to it. Uh, as, I, as I told the, the people the other day at the Jersey Devil thing, we human beings, we're the biggest scaredy cats in the universe. <laughs> Everything scares us. And we're constantly trying to explain our fear. And I think, again, I'm not a psychologist, uh, but I think part of these legends is our attempt as, as human beings to explain ourselves and our place in the world. And so, you know, there are, there are Native American wild man legends, there are African wild man legends, there are Asiatic wild man legends. Uh, there's, there's wild man legends, Bigfoot-like legends everywhere. And what that says about us, I'm not sure. <laughs> yes? Do you have any information on Dr. Melba Ketchum? Uh, yeah, she's the, 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 the geneticist from Texas, yeah. who last year... Yeah, under very disputed, controversial terms, claims uh, that she had DNA evidence, which first off proved Bigfoot was, and Sasquatch is real. And just to make this even more complicated, there are those within that community who feel Bigfoot and Sasquatch are not the same, <laughs> that they're different creatures. Uh, but that she had DNA evidence which not only proved Bigfoot was real, but that Bigfoot was a human hybrid. And um, it's caused quite a bit of controversy still. People are still arguing about it. And uh, you know, there are those. Show her records, right? um, she put it in a journal, which had then turned out a journal she bought, <laughs> uh, which had been about to close down. And so she and some backers put the money together to buy this journal and then published it in there. And so that, that seems kind of you know, shady. And, and I mean, I don't know, Dr. Ketchum. I have no uh, connection with her whatsoever. I just know what I've read in various articles and online. Um, but the whole case seems somewhat sketchy. And we she hasn't to. passed that on for somebody else to examine? As far as I know, Somebody, she a hasn't. disinterested party, not right. the purpose of right. it. We, we, we yeah. have to get this straight because um, she uh, went outside of her house one day and it was a half-eaten blueberry bagel. Right, there were, and that was the which also evidence. brought ridicule. Yes, and mm -hmm. they did a DNA test on, on whatever was on this bagel, and they couldn't <laughs> identify the, um, uh, the, the DNA, so therefore... Well, yeah. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's, there's a whole subculture <laughs> of... Sasquatch is Jewish. He likes a nice schmear. But there's a whole subculture of what we might, for the lack of a better expression, call Bigfoot contactees. <laughs> <laughs> and if that hasn't been copyrighted yet, I'm, I'm officially copywriting that. <laughs> um, who claim that they haven't just seen Bigfoot, which is, you know, 99%, I saw Bigfoot, I got scared, I ran away, or I saw Bigfoot, Bigfoot got scared and ran away, and that's sort of the end of the encounter. Uh, but there's this other subculture of people who claim that they actually interact with these creatures on a regular basis. Oh, these are like the trans-dimensional alien? Well, uh, there's, <laughs> there's the sub-subculture yeah. <laughs> that believes that Bigfoot are spiritual beings. Right. But the reason why you can't catch them is that they can somehow dematerialize or they are shapeshifters, um, which, which is a term you get from Star Trek. Um, but there, there are these people who claim that they live in rural areas, as you can imagine, 
uh, on sort of isolated farms that say that for years, Bigfoots have been coming onto their property and interacting with them and speaking, that there's a Bigfoot language, uh, and some of them have learned to speak a little bit of English, and that they trade food, uh, and my, I hate to make fun of people. Oh, go ahead. Bye. But, <laughs> well, rather make fun, I might ask this question of the Bigfoot contactees. If you're upset with us because we don't believe you, there's a very simple way to end all of this. The next time your Bigfoot friend comes up to the back door looking for garlic, and you have a lovely conversation with Bigfoot, while you're doing that, reach into your pocket, take out your camera, and go like that, and continue your conversation. And Bigfoot will never know the difference, because I'm assuming they don't get a lot of, you know, Bigfoot don't own cameras. Uh, and that way you can have a nice, clear, in focus, up close and personal photograph that will end the controversy one, you know, uh, Yeah, they had a big thing in Russia last year or the year before. And the, the Wall Street Journal interviewed me over this. And I didn't really have anything to do with it. I was just being asked as, as someone who knows the material. Um, and this woman, one of these contact e women, women, went to Moscow for this thing. Because they said they had, were seeing the abominable snowman yetis in some, some part of Siberia somewhere. And they wanted the world to know. And this woman went and was asked to speak. And I said, no, that's fine. God bless you. You can afford to fly to Moscow, but you can't afford to buy a disposable camera and take a couple, you know, a couple snappy snaps, and uh, we'll all believe you. You'll, you know, you, you imagine how much they could sell these pictures for. Uh, but so far, that hasn't happened. <laughs> yeah, you know, shake your hand, pull a couple of hairs, something. something. <laughs> Uh, on this whole photograph thing, I will end with this. There are so many cameras around. When the first plane crashed into the World Trade Center on September 11th, there was a fire unit on the street of Manhattan making a commercial. They were filming a commercial for the you know public commercial, public address commercial for the fire department. And the plane flies overhead. And the cameraman, you know, because planes don't fly that low over there. It's the only film we know of, of the first plane crashing into the World Trade Center. What are the odds that that happened? I mean, that's a million to one shot that in this event, someone happened to be standing there with a camera. If that could occur, <laughs> if you could beat those odds, you can get lots of really clear pictures of Bigfoot. <laughs> uh, because people are out to look, it wasn't like they were waiting, they knew this was going to happen, and they were waiting, we'll get it on film. They just happened to be in the right place at the right time. If all these legions of people are out there searching for these things, you've got to get a good picture. Somewhere you've got to get a good picture. And that just hasn't happened. I would like to thank you all for coming. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Brian, for sharing that uh, with us and everybody. Uh, please remember, big opportunity, April 28th, Monday night, 7.30 at the Bodell.